Hello, welcome to Blessed Man Meditations. My name is Andy. If you are new to my channel, you will have seen uh, other videos uh, posted on the evidence for the resurrection and a couple of other topics prior to that. Uh, this is, I believe, installment number five on the evidence for the resurrection uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, if you find value in my work and work such as this video or any of the previous ones, uh, please consider supporting my ministry by, by purchasing my published work. It's a commentary on the first 30 chapters of the book of Psalms. Uh, the content uh, that these presentations uh, are based from comes from this book, Josh McDowell's The New Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Uh, it's a very good book on the evidence for the resurrection. He, he uh, is a very well-read man who's done a lot of reading on, um, on many uh, topics as, that pertain to Christianity, and this is the chapter in this book from the evidence for the resurrection. I hope to incorporate uh, content from this book uh, in future presentations uh, as well. Norm Geisler, Frank Turek, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. So today we're going to begin talking about the empty tomb. Winfried Corduan, Corduan said, If ever a fact of, the, of ancient history may count as indisputable, it should be the empty tomb. From Easter Sunday on, there must have been a tomb, clearly known as the tomb of Jesus, that did not contain his body. This much is beyond dispute. Christian teaching from the very beginning promoted a living, resurrected Savior. The Jewish authorities strongly opposed this teaching and were prepared to go to any length in order to suppress it. Their job would have been easy if they could have invited potential converts for a quick stroll to the tomb and there produce Christ's body. That would have been the end of the Christian message. The fact that a church centering around the risen Christ could come about demonstrates that there must have been an empty tomb. Right, I mean, had the... Uh, had the, had the enemies of our Lord uh, been able to produce uh, the, the deceased body of our Lord, um, that would have been the end of, of the Christian message, because the central part of the Christian message is the resurrection. Uh, otherwise, he's just a good man who died for a cause. And there have been plenty of those throughout history. But if he rose from the dead, then he's not just any man, but he is the Lord. William Lane Craig. The empty tomb is the sine qua non of the resurrection. The notion that Jesus rose from the dead with a new body while his old body still lay in the grave is a modern conception. Jewish mentality would have never accepted a division of two bodies. Even if the disciples failed to check the empty tomb, the Jewish authorities could have been guilty of no such oversight. When, therefore, the disciples began to preach the resurrection in Jerusalem and people responded, and when religious authorities stood helplessly by, the tomb must have been empty. The simple fact that the Christian fellowship founded on the belief in Jesus' resurrection, came into existence and flourished in the very city where he was executed and, and buried, is powerful evidence for the historicity of the empty tomb. Right, so for a message of this magnitude, of this content to be preached, uh, there, there had to be an empty tomb. W.J. Sparrow Simpson points out that the empty tomb by itself did not cause the disciples to believe. Of John, it is said, he saw and believed. This, however, is probably because he remembered that Christ had foretold his resurrection. Neither Mary Magdalene, nor the women, nor even Peter were brought to believe by the testimony of the empty tomb. It was Christ's post-resurrection appearances that had assured his followers that he had actually risen from the dead. The empty tomb stood as a historical fact, verifying the appearances as being nothing less uh, than Jesus of Nazareth resurrected in flesh and blood. Yes, had this man that they saw claiming to be Jesus, um, had, had they been able to go to his empty tomb and see his body still laying there, then it would have been obvious that the man that they saw could not have been the real uh, Christ, or maybe it was a hallucination, like the skeptics will say now. But because the tomb was empty, there's no way it could be a hallucination, but, but really it is the literal bodily resurrected Lord. J.N.D. Anderson. 
asks, have you noticed that the references to the empty tomb all come in the Gospels, which were written to give the Christian community the facts they wanted to know? In the public preaching of those who were not believers, as recorded in the Acts of the Apostles, there is an enormous emphasis on the fact of the resurrection, but not a single reference to the empty tomb. Now why? To me, there's only one answer. There was no point in arguing about the empty tomb. Everyone, friend and opponent, knew that it was empty. The only questions worth arguing about were why it was empty and what the emptiness proved. Yes, even the enemies did not uh, argue that there was no em that there was an empty tomb. It was a obvious fact. They had to make up stories as to why it was empty. Anderson says, The empty tomb stands, a veritable rock, as an essential element in the evidence for the resurrection. To suggest that it was not a fact, that it was not in fact empty at all, as some have done, seems to me ridiculous. It is a matter of history that the apostles, from the very beginning, made many converts in Jerusalem, hostile as it was, by proclaiming the glad news that Christ had risen from the grave, and they did it with a short walk from the sepulchre. Any one of their hearers could have visited the tomb and come back again between lunch and whatever may have been the equivalent of afternoon tea. All they had to do was walk and look at it. That tomb was very well known because... There was a reputation about Jesus. People said all kinds of things about him. And there were all kinds of opinions about him. All they, His tomb would have been very well known. All they had to do was go look at it. And if it was empty, since it was empty, we have the Christian message. Anderson says, Is it conceivable then that the apostles would have had this success if the body of the one they proclaimed as risen Lord was all the time decomposing in Joseph's tomb? Would a great company of priests and many hard-headed Pharisees have been impressed with the proclamation of a resurrection, which was in fact no resurrection at all, but a mere message of spiritual survival couched in the misleading terms of a literal rising from the grave? There would have been nothing to argue about if they would have been able to produce the Lord's body. Paul Althus, cited by Wolfhart Pannenberg, says, in Jerusalem, the place of Jesus' execution and grave, it, is, it was proclaimed not long after his death that he had been raised. The situation demands that within the circle of the first community, one had a reliable testimony for the fact that the grave had been found empty. The, res the resurrection proclamation could not have been maintained in Jerusalem for a single day, for a single hour, if the emptiness of the tomb had not been established as a fact for all concerned. Uh, in a in uh, Alfred Edersheim's The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah, E. H. Day comments, If it be asserted that the tomb was in fact not found to be empty, several difficulties confront, confront the critic. The critic has to meet, for example, the problem of the rapid rise of the very definite tradition, never seriously question the problem of the circumstantial nature of the accounts in which the tradition is embodied, the problem of the failure of the Jews to prove that the resurrection had not taken place by producing the body of Christ, or by an official examination of the sepulchre, a proof which it was to their greatest interest to exhibit. Yes, they were so bent on overthrowing Jesus and minimizing his influence, they could have easily done it if they could have produced Christ's body uh, and, and shown that the tomb was not empty. Frank Morrison, in Who Moved the Stone, comments, In all the fragments and echoes of this far-off controversy which had come down to us, we are nowhere told that any responsible person asserted that the body of Jesus was still in the tomb. We're only given reasons why it was not there. Running all through these ancient documents is the persi persistent assumption that the tomb of Christ was vacant. Can we find the face of this cumulative and mutually corroborative evidence? Personally, I do not think we can. The sequence of coincidences is too strong. Michael Green in Man Alive cites a secular source of early origin that bears testimony to Jesus' empty tomb. This piece of evidence is called the Nazareth inscription after the town where it was found. It is an imperial edict belonging either to the reign of Tiberius or, Cla or of Claudius, and it is an invective backed with heavy sanctions against meddling around with tombs and graves. 
It looks very much as if the news of the empty tomb had got back to Rome in a garbled form, for Pilate would have, would have had to report, and he would obviously have said that the tomb had been rifled. This edict, it seems, is the imperial reaction. Okay. Green concludes, there can be no doubt that the tomb of Jesus was in fact empty on the first Easter day. James Hastings in the Dictionary of the Apostolic Church says uh, that Matthew 28, uh, well, let's see. Um, yeah, in commenting on Matthew 28, which records the attempt of the Jewish authorities to bribe the Roman guard to say that the disciples stole the body of Jesus, the dictionary says, this fraudulent transaction proceeds upon the admission by the enemies of Christianity in Christianity that the grave was empty, an admission which is enough to show that the evidence for the empty grave was too notorious to be denied. Yes, instead of instead of coming up with proof to show that it wasn't empty, they had to come up with a story to cover their tracks. The enemies of Christ had to. J.P. Moreland concludes, in some, the absence of explicit mention of the empty tomb in speeches and acts is best explained by noting the fact that uh, by noting that the fact of the empty tomb was not in dispute, and thus it was not at issue. The main debate was over why it was empty, not whether it was empty. No need existed for the early Christian preachers to make a major, a major issue of the empty tomb. It was common knowledge which could easily be verified if such verification was needed. J.P. Moore. W.J. Sparrow Simpson. The emptiness of the grave is, now, is acknowledged by opponents as well as affirmed by the disciples. The, narr the narratives of the guards attempts to account for the fact as a fraudulent transaction. But this Jewish accusation against the apostles takes for granted that the grave was empty. What was needed was an explanation. This acknowledgement by the Jews that the grave was vacated extends to all subsequent Jewish comments on the point. Sparrow Simpson supports this point by citing an example. In the, uh, a 12th century version of the empty grave circulated by the Jewish anti-Christian propaganda. The story is that when the queen heard that the elders had slain Jesus and had buried him, that he was risen again, and that he was risen again, she ordered them within three days to produce the body or forfeit their lives. Then spake Jesus, Come, and I will show you the man whom you seek. For it was I who took the fatherless from his grave. For I fear lest his disciples should steal him away, and I have hidden him in my garden, and let a water brook over to the place. And the story explains how the body was produced. This is just a, uh, a, a way to explain away the empty tomb. Sparrow Simpson concludes, It's needless to remark that this daring assertion of the actual production of the body is a medieval fabrication. But it is an assertion very necessary to account for facts when the emptiness of the grave is admitted and yet resurrection denied. Yeah, you got to make up stuff if you don't want to believe what Jesus predicted about himself. What's been preached since the, be since the beginning of when the church was born. You've got to come up with excuses. You've got you've to try to undermine the clear truth. And that's what people have done. Ernest Kivon cites as evidence what he describes as the indisputable fact of the empty tomb. The tomb was empty, and the foes of Christ were unable to deny it. The fact of the empty tomb deals a mortal blow to all the hypotheses which are, set, which are set up against the Christian testimony. This is the stone over which all specious theories stumble, and it is therefore not surprising to discover that reference to the empty tomb is studiously avoided by many of the counter-arguments which are brought forward. Sparrow Simpson again, citing Julius Wellhausen, the old, ger fam old famous German scholar noted for his higher criticism of the Old Testament, gives this testimony concerning Christ's resurrection. It's admitted that, that with the resurrection of the body of Jesus also uh, had vanished from the grave, and it will be impossible to account for this on natural grounds. Jane D. Anderson, why did Jesus' uh, grave not become an object of veneration? Anderson comments that it is also significant that no suggestion has come down to us that the tomb became a place of reverence or pilgrimage in the days of the early church. Even if those who were convinced Christians might have been deflected from visiting the sepulchre by their assurance that their master had risen from the dead, 
What of all those who'd heard his teaching and even known the miracles of his healing touch without joining the Christian community? They too, it would seem, knew that his body was not there and must have concluded that a visit to the tomb would be pointless. Right, there was no point in going and visiting there because uh, it was going to be obvious that the body was not there because of the message getting around that it was not there. I'm sure there must have been people who weren't recorded in any of the Gospels who went and visited the tomb and couldn't believe their eyes, but then um, enough word would have gotten back that such visits would have become unnecessary. Frank Morrison, who moved the stone, makes an interesting observation. Consider first the small but highly significant fact that not a trace exists in the Acts or the missionary epistles or in any apocryphal document of indisputably early date of anyone going to pay homage at the shrine of Jesus Christ. It's remarkable, this absolutely unbroken silence concerning the most sacred place in Christian memory. Would no woman to whom the Master's form was, was a hallowed recollection ever wish to spend a few moments at that holy site? Would Peter and John and Andrew never feel the call of a sanctuary that held all that was mortal of the great master? Would Saul himself, recalling his earlier arrogance and self-assurance, not have made one solitary journey and shed hot tears of repentance for his denial uh, of the name? If these people really knew that the Lord was buried there, it is very, very strange. To a critic of the resurrection, this extraordinary silence of antiquity concerning the later history of the grave of Jesus produces, I'm sure, a feeling of profound disquiet and unrest. Yes, the fact that uh, that people would go, that if people went to the tomb, they couldn't find anything uh, there because he wasn't there. Um, the fact that uh, there is no, uh, that there was no uh, object of veneration produced there. Um, there's, there's, there's just nothing. Uh, Post-resurrection scene. Now we're going to talk about uh, the grave clothes. That were found in the empty tomb. John chapter 20, beginning in verse 3, John shows the significance of the grave, closes evidence for the resurrection. Uh, Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going out and going to the tomb. So they both ran together. The other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looked in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came and following him and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Commenting on this narrative from John, J.D. Anderson says at the empty tomb, it seems that it wasn't really empty. You remember the account in John's gospel of how Mary Magdalene ran and called Peter and John, how the two men set out to the tomb. John the younger ran on quicker than Peter and came first to the tomb. He stooped down, peeped inside, uh, and saw the linen cloths and napkin that had been about the dead. And then Simon Peter came along and characteristically blundered straight in, followed by John, and they took note of the linen cloths and the napkin, which was not lying with the linen, clo linen cloths, but was apart, uh, wrapped into one place. The Greek there seems to suggest that the linen cloths were lying, not strewn about the tomb, but where the body had been, and that there was a gap where the neck of Christ had lain. And that the napkin, which had been about his head, was not with the linen clothes, but apart and wrapped in its own place, which I suppose means still done up, as though the body had simply withdrawn itself. We're told that when John saw that, he needed no further testimony from man or angel. He saw and believed, and his testimony, had come, that had, and his testimony has come down to us. E. Hermitage Day on the Evidence for the Resurrection, his book. It is characterized throughout by the personal touch. It has all the marks of the evidence, not only of an eyewitness, but of a careful observer. The running of the disciples, the order of their arrival at the sepulchre and their entry, the fact that St. John first stooped down and looking through the low doorway saw the linen clothes lying where St. Peter, more bold, was the first to enter the exact word. Um which is used for St. Peter's careful observation. Even examination may perhaps be implied in it of the grave clothes. The description of the 
of the position of the linen clothes in the napkin, a description not labored, but minutely careful in its choice of words, the subsequent entry of St. John and the belief which followed upon the sight of the grave clothes. This can surely be nothing else than a description of one who actually saw upon whose memory the scene is still impressed, to whom the sight of the empty grave and rel relinquished grave clothes was a critical point in faith and life. So, the written uh, record of the empty grave is a powerful testimony to the evidence of the resurrection. Henry Latham writes of the face cloth that had covered Jesus' head. The words, not lying with the linen cloths, yielded me something. They tell me, incidentally, that the linen cloths were all in one place. If they were lying, as I take them to have done, all upon the lower part of the ledge, the expression's perfectly clear. But if the linen cloths had been lying, one here and one there, as though they'd been hastily thrown aside, there would have been no meaning in saying that the napkin was not lying with the linen cloths, for the linen cloths would not have defined any particular spot. We again note the introduction of the word lying when it was not absolutely required. The napkin was not lying flat as the linen cloths were, and St. John perhaps marks the difference. Latham continues, A napkin, which had been twisted round about the, around the top of the head, would remain on the elevated slab. There it would be found rolled up in a place by itself. Latham says that the uh, phrase rolled up is ambiguous. The twisted napkin, I suppose, formed a ring, like the roll of a turban loosed without the central part. So he's describing the scene there in the empty tomb. Latham concludes, There lie the clothes. They are, fall they are fallen a little together, but are still wrapped fold over fold, and no grain of spice is displaced. The napkin, too, is lying on the low step, which serves as a pillow for the head of the corpse. It is twisted into a sort of wig and is all by itself. The very quietude of the scene makes it seem to have something to say. It spoke to those who saw it, and it speaks to me when I conjure it before my mind's eye with the morning light from the open doorway streaming in. When it says I, when it says I make out to be this, all that, all that was Jesus of Nazareth has suffered, it's changed and is gone. We, grave clothes and spices and napkin, belong to the earth and remain. Okay, uh, now we're going to talk about the seal. Uh, Robertson, A.T. Robertson, Greek scholar. The sealing was done in the presence of the Roman guard who were left in charge to protect the stamp of Roman authority. Uh, okay, the D.D. Whedon. The door could not be opened, therefore, without breaking the seal, which was a crime against the authority of the proprietor of the seal. Okay, the seal was broken when the stone was rolled away. The person or persons who are responsible for breaking the seal would be uh, the provincial governor and his agencies to answer to. They, they, would, they would have to answer. Indeed, at the time of Christ's resurrection, everyone feared the breaking of the Roman seal. They didn't want to get in trouble. Now we're going to talk about the Roman guard. Understanding who these guards were makes the narrative of Matthew 28 very impressive. The sight which coincided with Jesus' resurrection was frightening enough to cause rugged soldiers to become like dead men. Yeah, these guys are intimidating and powerful looking and dangerous and could easily kill somebody if they had to, but suddenly they became like dead men. They saw something that was so magnificent that they became like dead men. Albert Roper and Jesus, did Jesus rise from the dead? They had not the slightest interest in the task at which they were assigned. Their sole purpose and obligation was originally to perform their duty as soldiers of the uh, Empire of Rome to which they had dedicated their allegiance. The Roman seal affixed to the stone before Jesus' tomb was far more sacred to them than all the philosophy of Israel or the sanctity of her ancient creed. They were cold-blooded enough to gamble over a, victim's dying, uh, over a dying victim's cloak. T.G. Tucker describes in great detail the armor and weapons that a centurion would have worn. The picture he gives is of a human fighting machine in this book here at the left. Thomas Thorburn in the Resurrection Narratives and, Moder and Modern Criticism tells us that the guard that had kept the watch was in dire straits. After the stone had been rolled away and the seal broken, they were as good as court-martialed. Thorburn writes, the soldiers cannot have alleged that uh, the soldiers cannot have alleged that they were asleep for they well knew that the penalty of sleeping upon a watch was death and that was always rigorously enforced he continues here the soldiers would have practically no other alternative than to trust the good offices of the priest 
the body, we will suppose, was gone, and their negligence in any case, under ordinary circumstances, was punishable by death. So we're finished with this one. Um, next time we're going to talk about how Jesus was alive. And um, we're going to talk about his appearances, his post-resurrection post appearances. We're going to talk about the uh, what the enemies of Christ did not say about his about his resurrection, um, about how they mocked, and we're going to talk about um, historical and psychological facts. So. Thank you for watching, and I hope you have a blessed rest of your day.